want to point out that uh, these arguments that people put forth today for the flat earth, supposedly from the Bible, don't come uh, historically positions of the church. The church never argued these points from Scripture. This all arose in the 19th century. And surprisingly enough, these arguments that flat earthers are using, supposedly from the Bible to support flat earth, are ones that are put forth from the skeptics and the atheists in the 19th century, mm -hmm. trying to dis, uh, to uh, bring disrepute upon the scripture, showing it's not authoritative. So I'm, I'm puzzled, and it breaks my heart at the same time, to see people parroting arguments that are 140, 150 right. years old. From people who are skeptics. An atheist, you know, so you're, folks, you're using their arguments, not right. the church's arguments. Check right. the history on that, and you'll yeah. find out what I'm telling you is the truth here. False. The Flat Earth movement that he's referring to in the middle to late 19th century, involving individuals like Sam Robotham and the formation of the Universal Zetetic Society, which followed, is demonstrably provable to have been comprised of Christians who were concerned with the veracity of scripture, with the historical accuracy of Genesis and the creation account, and with standing firm against the rise of evolution. There are many books that were printed during this time as well as the publication Earth Not a Globe Review, all of which include a great amount of biblical discussion, and you can read them for yourself and see that what Faulkner here is saying is just patently untrue. Links will be in the description. And one thing you got to keep in mind is that some people, uh, you know, they accuse us of believing everything in the Bible is literal. Well, we don't believe everything in the Bible is literal. There are many idioms, there are figures of speech, there are also imagery, particularly in the in the poetic and the uh, uh, prophetic passages. Right. In fact, right. most of the arguments are coming from those books where there is imagery and the simile and, and uh, metaphor. But for instance, uh, Jesus said, I am the door. Well, did he have hinges? Did he have right. a, a latch on it? Did he have a handle? <laughs> you know, of course not. We understand that it's not a literal door. So nobody really believes that the Bible is completely literal. This is a rather pitiful and patronizing argument indeed, because obviously, Everyone who believes in the Bible should understand that there is idiom and metaphor and analogy. But the question is, which parts are which? Because it should be well understood by anyone who believes the Bible to be true in any capacity that the most popular device of biblical deconstructionism is to reduce whichever parts of the Bible they don't like to allegory and metaphor and meaning something else other than the plain and straightforward meaning. So really the entire debate boils down to whether or not either side is guilty of flip-flopping between literal interpretation and metaphorical interpretation whenever it might be convenient to try and defend the particular cosmology they've already predetermined to be true. One last thing, a lot of these are not really looked at in context. If you look at it in context, you'll see it means something very different. But anyway, uh, one put forth by some people, again, most flat earthers don't do that, is they talk about the three times that the four corners of the earth are mentioned, twice in Revelation, once in Isaiah. They say, see, on a, on a spherical earth, you cannot have uh, four corners. And that's true. However, every model of the flat earth I've ever seen out there is round and flat like this. Mm -hmm. There are no corners on this either. So it would argue against this, um, oh, we talked about the snow globe yeah. model the other day. Right. And uh, particularly I wanted to mention um, the one in Revelation 7-1. It also mentions the four angels standing at the uh, four winds and talking about the four corners. And the repetition of four there is I think very significant. The four winds generally refers to north, south, east, and west. Right. Today we talk about winds coming from those directions or combinations of directions. So this is an idiomatic expression referring, referring to the four directions in space on the earth. For one thing, there are a number of different flat earth models and concepts which do involve four literal corners. Not to mention the fact that we don't pretend to understand how it all works, but we do know that the Bible says what it says. And it is not inconceivable to even think that the four corners could lie outside of the, the lit circle of the flat earth. Or even within a circular earth, you can still have four corners or four quadrants, four terminus points at farthest extensions from the center, as opposed to the idiomatic interpretation that he applies to that verse in Revelation, which if you really think about it, renders it almost meaningless because it's saying that the angels stood at the four corners and the holding back the four winds. How do four angels, which presumably are not idiomatic themselves, but referring to four literal angels, how do four angels stand in four cardinal directions, when particularly on a globe, only north and south have a specific location, and east and west are simply, are simply directions of circumnavigation? An angel cannot stand at an eastern or western corner on a globe. 
and thus even as an idiomatic expression it's completely nonsensical uh, well, it, we need, you know and we need to take the bible as it's written i mean not mm-hmm. everything literally no one no one believes i don't it. know anyone that does that i mean but you take it as it's written so history is history poetry is poetry you know prophecy is prophecy and that that's important to remember and not to take it out of context that's it. you have to take the surrounding verses around it as well i absolutely agree just remember that it works both ways is Genesis allegory or poetry, or is it a true historical account? And the, uh, the another idiomatic expression is the ends of the earth recurs 28 mm-hmm. times. They say, well, you can't, you, you, uh, you can't have ends of the earth right. on, on a spherical round. earth. Mm-hmm. But that's not the point. The, in those cases, referring to the most uh, remote, remotest parts of the inhabited earth, I uh, suggest Psalm 67, 7, 98, 3, and Isaiah 45, 22 are examples of those. And again, go to my article and look at that. Again, when interpreted as an idiomatic expression, on a globe, this doesn't make any sense once again, because on a globe, no point is any more remote than any other point. Every point on the globe has an antipode or an opposite point on the other side of the ball. And thus to try and speak about the, quote, most remote parts of the earth is completely relative and ultimately meaningless. Um, one of the, I think one of the most bizarre ones <laughs> that are given is uh, Daniel 4, 11, and 20. And there it's, uh, they quote that with those two verses, or either one of those verses. You have a tree here that grows a tremendous height, and it's, the tree is so tall it's visible from everywhere on the earth. And, of course, on a spherical earth that's not possible, but on a flat earth it is. So, therefore, Daniel is teaching that the earth is flat. Uh, well, okay, folks, read the entire chapter. Right. You, you'll see that it's an account of one of the dreams of King Nebuchadnezzar. This tree that was so tall to be seen from all the earth was in a dream. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing in a dream is real. Uh, furthermore, well, we don't even know if that if that uh, correctly reflected the cosmology of Nebuchadnezzar. Maybe it did. Maybe it did. Right. Doesn't really matter. It's a symbol of something. Symbol of something. Because yeah. actually, in verse um, in verses twenty and twenty two, Daniel giving the uh, interpretation of the dream says that Nebuchadnezzar is the tree. He doesn't say he's like the tree. It says, Nebuchadnezzar, you are that tree, which, by the way, did I mention, is in a dream. Mm-hmm. So it's a, non, it's, it's a representation of something that's not even real. It's not literal in this case. So if you read the whole chapter, you would never come away saying, well, this means, proves the earth is flat. It just, it's not possible to think that in a rational world, I don't believe. Yes, it was in a dream. But what is actually not rational is to forget the fact that even in a dream, the person having the dream, in this case Nebuchadnezzar, was simply relaying to Daniel what he saw in the dream. It was a visual representation of something. And regardless of the fact that it was metaphorical for something else, namely his own rise and fall of his kingdom, that metaphorical vision still occurred within the confines of a cosmological model, and that model was not the globe. Well, someone had asked, and this kind of goes along with the whole idea of that tree thing, it said that the Earth is flat, how come you can't see China with a telescope while standing on top of the Chrysler building? Well, the Earth is flat, and it's clear you should be able to do that if the Earth is flat. And if the sky is clear enough, and right. later on, some physical evidence, they'll right. talk about that. Right. But yeah, that would be, if the Earth is flat, and you've got any kind of tall, tall thing here, you mm-hmm. should be able to see it. Right. But this- Wrong. You cannot see for infinite distances on a flat Earth simply because of things like atmospheric interference. The further away an object is that you're trying to look at, the more air molecules are blocking your view, not to mention the limitations of sight and perspective. Now, a little better is in Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 to 11. You have the temptation of Jesus, and one of the temptations he's taken up to us is a high mountain, and he sees all the kingdoms of the world. And they say, aha, only from a flat Earth could you see see all the kingdoms of the world from a tall mountain. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, fine. Where is that mountain? Right. Does it not exist anymore? What happened to it? You know, if it's there, we ought to be able to see it, or we we can go to it. I don't think that mountain really exists in that situation. Furthermore, they avoid the parallel passage of Luke 4, uh, verses 1 through 13, Mm -hmm. because it doesn't say mountain, it says a high place. In fact, the terminology used there, read my article if you want to read more about that, uh, suggests that instead of being a literal mountain and being shown literally all the kingdoms, it's talking about all the kingdoms throughout the ages, Mm -hmm. and it's a vision sort of thing that's being offered to Jesus there, not a literal mountain and not a literal view from such a literal mountain. Interesting. So did the desert that Jesus was in for 40 days not exist either? What about the temple that he was taken up to on the last temptation from Satan? Apparently Faulkner just feels free to pick and choose which portions are literal and which ones are just idiomatic. Here's another one from uh, 1 Samuel 2.8. It talks about the earth resting on pillars. 
and you'll get some people out there. Again, these diagrams were done by the skeptics in the late 19th, early mm -hmm. 20th century. You've got this flat earth, a dome, and pillars underneath. And they say, this is the biblical cosmology. Folks, these diagrams were done originally by liberals, by atheists, by mm -hmm. agnostics trying to discredit scripture. Once again, this is a claim they are constantly making, but it is actually the complete opposite of what historical documentation shows. Furthermore, if the earth is resting on pillars, that doesn't square very well with Job 26.7, which says God yeah, hangs the earth nothing. upon nothing. <laughs> well, which is it? Does it not have anything supporting it, or does it have pillars supporting it? Well, resting on something is rather different than hanging from something else, is it not? Furthermore, we're told elsewhere in the New Testament that uh, good men, including uh, especially the, the leaders of the church, are pillars. It doesn't say they're like pillars, it says they are pillars. I've not seen a deacon or elder yet that was made out of limestone or something, you know. It's obviously a, a symbolic user there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there it's obviously symbolic. Do you see how desperately he's reaching now? And finally, one last one I'll mention. This is uh, intersects with the... Uh, with a geocentrist, and, and a person who is a flat earther is also a geocentrist, but the other the reverse is not necessarily true. And they uh, argue from several passages, such as First Chronicles 16.30, Psalm 93.1, and 96.10, that the earth is said to be immovable. So if it's immovable, it just sits here, it doesn't move at all, and of course if the earth is spinning and orbiting around the sun, it's moving, and so consequently that is contrary uh, to scripture. Well, wait a minute. In 1 Corinthians 15, 58, the Apostle Paul exhorts us to be steadfast, immovable. Mm -hmm. So folks, unless you're still laying in bed from when you got up this morning or didn't get up, you just woke up this morning, then you have violated God's clearly stated intention for your life to be immovable. Clearly that immovable that Paul talked about uh, was not talking about geographically sitting still. Right. It was talking about not being moved from our faith and our, and our practice mm -hmm. and our belief. But also consider, that's also New Testament, I understand, but look at Psalm 16, 8, the same word that used to describe the immovable earth, David refers to himself, because God is his right hand, I will be immovable, he says. Mm -hmm. So obviously David never moved, he sat still. Well, that's clearly not the case either. So it turns out the meaning of that Hebrew word is not to vary from your prepared course. Course implies emotion. So is the earth immovable in that sense? Yes, it doesn't veer from the course it's, it's moving on. It's not chaotic. It's not random. It has a st stayed course that God has ordained for it. That is the reality of the situation on these things. Now, so to summarize, fixed and unmoving really means moving at thousands of miles an hour through space on a fixed course. Yeah, that sounds like sound exegesis. It's not a... Uh, the, I go through these passages and I just have to kind of chuckle, roll my eyes that people are taking these many times out of context and not reading them in context is even more important and then um, being hyper-literal about this and uh, not realizing just what these words actually mean. It's rather astounding indeed, isn't it, to be accused of, quote, hyper-literalism when this is simply the same approach to the Bible that we've used in order to conclude that the earth was made in six literal days, that there was a literal flood that covered the whole world, that Jesus was a literal man who was really the Son of God incarnate, who died on a literal cross for literally the sins of the entire world, and he literally rose from the dead three days later. He had literal scars on his hands and his side, and he literally ascended up into heaven into the literal sky.